Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Biological Physics Physical Biology Seminar Series. Uh, today we have two awesome talks uh, from uh, Keisuke uh, Ishihara from uh, the Department of Computational and Systems Biology in the University of Pittsburgh, who's going to tell us about topological control of organoid morphogenesis. And then by Diego Kraft from Colorado State University, he's going to tell us about uh, uh, diffusion in the cytoplasm of um, cells. So uh, I guess we are on the R. So let's just maybe give a few more seconds for people to join. Uh, and uh, and then we can and then we can begin. Uh, so please uh, type your please keep yourself muted. Uh, this meeting this is going the the uh, seminar is going to be recorded. Uh, please keep yourself muted. Type your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll ask your questions for you during the hour of the uh, of the seminar. Uh, but we do invite you to stay on for an informal discussion after the hour is over with the two speakers where you can unmute and uh, and chat to them. Um, so I guess uh, I guess we could get started. Uh, Keisuke, take it away. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the series organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, my name is Keisuke. I just started, I just moved to Pittsburgh in December. Um, and to start my lab at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And today I'll be talking about my uh, postdoc work that was just published last year on uh, topological control of organoid morphogenesis. So, okay. Okay, so I'm what I'm really excited about um, in my um, lab is um, this idea of synthetic morphogenesis uh, for multicellular systems. So just let me like explain this uh, kind of like the research vision that I have. So basically, um, if you think about um, this abstract space, let's call this the morphological space where uh, basically different uh, multicellular systems can reside, take, can take different shapes and geometry, geometries. Um, in this context, normal development or normal morphogenesis actually occupies a relatively small space. But now um, biologists know that actually morphogenesis is a bit more than normal development. For example, um, mutations can uh, lead to striking um, uh, morphologies, for example, this two-headed tadpole here. But um, as a coming from an engineering physics background, I'm, what I'm really excited about is how can we push this even further? So how can we take synthetic approaches maybe using chemicals or genetics to really push the boundaries of this morphological space. And by doing so, can we learn new um, organizing principles for multicellular assemblies? Um, is self-organization even controllable? And um, I think this, is, this really pushes the, uh, the possibilities of multicellular systems. So, um, but before we talk, start talking about this grand idea, um, what one question really struck me was uh, what exactly is morphology, right? Um, this is a very, um, it was a very abstract question to me, but um, when I started thinking about this and finally led to the idea that like, okay, well, if we turn to mathematics, there's actually a very nice way of defining morphology as two um, complementary concepts, geometry and topology. So geometry is probably more familiar, uh, it's a familiar topic for biologists because it's really the study of size and shape. For example, like how the brains of different species um, change their shape and their size. Um, so then the question is, what about topology? How do you define topology for multicellular systems? And basically topology is the study of number of, and connectivity. And if we take the example of the brain, um, the human brain has a fluid filled ventricle and uh, if you just focus on the overall uh, tissue architecture in this way, it's basically, um, you can represent the topology of the system in a diagram um, shown above. And then when we turn to brain organoids that people have been uh, now generating in, in, the, in the lab, um, you, you might have seen these cross sections where uh, there are multiple of these uh, fluid cell uh, lumens or ventricles, and you can clearly see the topology is different um, from the actual actual brain. Now, if you think about it this way, topology is actually everywhere um, in developmental and disease. My favorite example is actually gas relation where this um, spherical uh, layer of cells um, in, um, 
in, involute and then basically transition into a torus. So this the, you can claim that gastrulation is essentially a sphere to a torus transition the topology. And then um, in the context of disease, um, I bring up this uh, polycystic kidney disease, which um, the kidney is basically uh, overwhelmed by these uh, uh, fluid-filled cysts, basically dead ends that uh, block the function of a normal tubular kidney. So um, um, really morphology uh, defined as a geometry and topology is really important um, for multicellular systems. And I really, I'm really excited about um, asking these questions um, for, our, for geometry and topology in the context of synthetic systems. So by synthetic, we, it's tissue reconstitution approaches, and this has many advantages. For example, the tissue that we're building is directly accessible by mi microscopy. So we can apply um, um, both 3D and 4D microscopy to really uh, analyze the tissue architecture quantitatively. Uh, we can generate many tissues in high throughput. And then because this is an in vitro system, uh, we can really control the physical and um, mechanical environments that the tissues are growing. So my talk today will really focus on this question of now that we've defined morphology as geometry and topology, how can we capture this? And by capture, uh, we can reform this question is what is a really essential feature space uh, for um, 3D structures like organoids? And this um, work today um, was um, done in collaboration with Argo um, We were both uh, uh, in, in Dresden around the same time and the Max Planck Institute. And then this uh, work is actually published uh, last year. So the experimental system I'm, I'm established as a postdoc is called neuroarticular organoids. It's um, very much inspired by the optic cup organoid protocol developed by Eric and Sasai. But basically, the it's it's a very simple 3D system where we start start with uh, 1,000 mouse embryonic stem cells in this um, low adhesion U bottom well. So it basically starts as a spheroid, but we do a neural induction. Um, differentiation, uh, supply it with some uh, extra matrix to really promote the epithelialization. So the cells basically start to form cell sheets. And then uh, we can uh, look at the tissue architecture. So uh, this staining here is showing ZOL1, which is uh, uh, apical membrane marker. And in this in vitro system, what I found was that we can actually uh, add uh, different chemical cues. And what I found was that the retinoic acid, which acts as a morphogen in many developmental contexts, uh, uh, the application of retinoic acid at day two led to the striking mor morphology at day four, as shown in this um, the lower panel here. So you can see that the, the overall tissue, uh, which was round in the control condition, is basically looked like this um, a bunch of grapes, um, I like to call it. So this was really a striking phenotype. And led me to the question of like, okay, how can we really understand um, the self-organization of this process? So I applied um, with high throughput imaging and 4D live imaging. So just to give you a, like a cellular architecture of how these look like, this is a zoom um, image of um, one of these um, tissues. You can see that uh, this is a pseudostratified epithelia. So you, it looks like there's like multiple um, nuclei, nuclear layers, but all cells actually have a both a apical and a basal uh, side. So it is a, a cell monolayer. And then throughout the talk, I'll be focusing on um, one side of this um, tissue, um, the, uh, the, the apical side of the membrane are marked in green. So we can basically um, do clear tissue imaging and high through confocal microscopy to really go through these tissues, um, typically um, 400 to 500 microns in um, um, depth. And then uh, what I uh, developed was a surface-based characterization of these um, tissues. So this is already done in the, after the image analysis and segmentation, I construct um, triangulated meshes. And this really allows you to basically, um, first of all, vi visualize um, the exact uh, 3D architecture. And in this uh, one, so on the left is showing the retinoic acid con condition, which was basically the, this bunch of grapes. Um, you can see that um, basically the, the individual um, lobes actually contain um, uh, fluid filled um, apical surfaces. And then throughout this talk, I'll be calling these um, um, uh, enclosed surfaces as lobules. And in this condition, you can start to see that this uh, is essentially a set of spheres and cylinders. So um, I like to call this spherical cylinders. And now we look at the other condition. 
which is basically it looks uh, as, as a round, uh, like a circular, uh, spherical structure. But what we find inside is actually this um, spherical shell with many of these passages. Now, this is a very um, complex, uh, unusual structure. But um, when we were staring at this for a while, we realized that this is uh, akin to this um, toy called the wiffle ball. I think people in North America might understand, but um, I have one here as well. It's essentially uh, uh, basically a plastic toy. But uh, what's nice about this is it really captures, first of all, this overall spherical um, geometry, but also the passages have this uh, a special topology. And by construct thinking about um, how these um, structures look like, we, we start to get a sense that, OK, these two conditions are clearly different. But now we have um, like hundreds of these 3D data. So how do we um, quantify uh, the, the both the topology and the shape of these structures? So to do this, um, I developed a, a framework to measure these um, important uh, aspects of uh, morphology. So the topology is um, relatively simple. We simply count the number of lobules in the system as well as the total number of passages. So basically, this is uh, G it stands for topological genus. And a sphere has no passages, so genus zero, and a torus would be um, one. And then something like a wiffle ball might have a very large number of G, like G, um, 19 here. Now, so that takes care of the topology. And then for the shape, um, what we do here is to um, calculate the, uh, the volume, the surface area, as well as the uh, integral curvature. Here, it's defined as the surface integral of mean curvature. And by taking these three quantities and normalizing them into uh, non-dimensional metrics, we can um, start to construct the shape diagram. Now, um, let's look at the actual um, experimental data now. So these are day four organoids from these two conditions. Um, first, the number of lobules is, uh, is a very clear difference for the similar sized organoid, um, basically the retinoic acid treated condition, this you know, bunch of grapes has more lobules. And then when we look at the number of passages, it's the converse, this untreated condition has more passages. So that really uh, is very simple, but captures the, the topological differences in these two conditions. Now for the shape, um, I'm gonna walk you through uh, what we call this, the shape diagram. So this, the X and Y axis are essentially the uh, normalized volume to area and the curvature to area ratios. And the key thing to understand first is that the perfect sphere is actually uh, represented as the point one one on the far right in this diagram. And basically, if you imagine a sphere becoming increasingly elongated, uh, and then we can calculate what the, the, the volume area and the curvatures are, um, this allows us to construct this solid line um, so basically, the higher you go, you go up to the left, um, this is a, a more elongated structure. And then we can do this exercise, um, because this is a theoretical um, curve, we can do this ex exercise for any kind of idealized geometry. So what I did was to construct a wiffle ball in 3D. And then here, it's actually fixing the number of um, passages, but um, increasing their diameters. And this allows this actually leads to this almost vertical line in the shape diagram for the wiffle ball. Now, these two lines are really important because they serve as a guide to understand the experimental data. So when we take the same organoids now, so this is basically 72 organoids, and then each dot is a, a, is a point, is an organoid here, we can see that um, the untreated and the retinoic acid um, con, uh, organoids, based on this characterization of uh, lobule shape, falls into um, the two, uh, uh, the, falls along these two lines for the sphero cylinder in the wiffle ball. So now we have a way to both quantitatively capture the overall topology as well as the shape of organoids. Now, th this was like really exciting because at the, around the same time, I was doing experiments as well and then figured out that we can actually do live imaging in this system. So um, this is actually um, was enabled by um, a dye called Seractin. So this is a very uh, nice dye, which um, some of you might have used. You just add it to the media and it binds to F-actin. And then for our system, basically the apical side is enriched in, in F-actin. So this was a really good marker for um, apical uh, surfaces. And then by using light sheet microscopy, which is very uh, a gentle uh, live imaging approach, we can get a nice um, Z stacks for these structures. So 
basically this this movie here is showing the untreated condition you see that over this 48 hours what happens is um, initially we have many small lobules and then they grow and fuse with each other and then in the untreated condition the fusion happens at, um, to an extent that in the end you basically end up with this large um, dominating structures um, with many passages now um, and then uh, what, what we can now do is to uh, go in and then take all the different time points and then analyze it in 3D. So here now is again the shapes diagram. Now the color is encoding for time. You can see that in the retinic acid condition, the initial time points are uh, start on the far right, and then as the time progresses, the the as the as all the lobules grow and fuse, and then. Um, it basically, it goes up this line, meaning it becomes increasingly elongated, but after 48 hours, it stays on this line. Now, for the uh, untreated condition, it starts out on, this, on a similar location on the sphere cylinder line, but around, um, this is, would be like 24 hours, um, it reaches this region in the uh, shape diagram where uh, the two lines for the sphere cylinder and wiffle ball are indistinguishable or cross. And then after that, it actually, the, the trajectory basically falls onto the wiffle ball um, line, uh, showing that uh, this really is the, the time point where the two uh, uh, morphologies uh, diverge in, term, uh, in the shape diagram. And then we can really tell um, when, and, when and how quantitatively how this occurs. Now, this is um, uh, the shape analysis over time, but we can also, of course, look at the topology. So topology is actually um, mediated by changes and, and ch changes in the number uh, and, and, and then in the, uh, the, uh, the passages, the system. And there's actually two types of uh, um, fusion, uh, lobule fusion that uh, underlies this. So in one uh, mode, uh, which we term transfusion, I think this is the more classical way of thinking about what, what people would imagine fusion. It's basically two lobules would fuse with one. So two becomes one and n decreases by one. So that that's uh, that happens at a, uh, in both conditions over time. But we actually found a, a, a second uh, mode of fusion, which we termed the cis-fusion. This is essentially a self-fusion where a single lobule would basically fuse with two ends with each other and leading to the creation of a passage. And that happens at a much higher frequency and the in the untreated condition. So just to summarize what we found based on the live imaging, basically the two modes of fusion really underlie uh, what we call like a shape topology interplay, because in this system, we start out with uh, uh, initial condition where we have many small spherical lobules. Uh, transfusion happens in both conditions leading to spherocylinders, but then, um, in the second half of the movie, or the, the from day three to day four, uh, cis fusion kicks in only in the untreated condition, leading to wiffle balls with many um, passages. So this is really a like a cartoon level summary of what we found from our quantitative analysis. But um, what what we have to remember that these things are actually cell layers. So this really begs the question of how can we really link these topological and shape changes um, from the perspective of um, cell and tissue mechanics? So to answer this question, um, um, I collaborate, this I really uh, work um, uh, together with uh, the theorist Argo Mukherjee, who uh, basically, we, uh, and we wanted, uh, we wanted to come about energetic framework for epithelial sheets. And basically, uh, to give you an overview, we, we start with a 3D vertex model that considers the cell scale parameters such as cell shape, cell adhesion, and typical basal tensions. And then we apply a coarse graining procedure to drive tissue scale parameters such as the mean and Gaussian curvature of the epithelial sheet. And also, uh, so those are kind of the, the curvatures, but if you look at this uh, energy equation, you can see that uh, there's a cofactor in front, which is basically the bending rigidities associated with these changes. So basically what we want to do is to use energy minimization principles to find how what, um, what conditions favor um, field bending and fusion. And this is very much the, the formalism that captures the physics of active deformable surfaces. And we got a lot of inspiration of the biophysicists who have been working about deformation of membrane vesicles. Now, so how do we... Um, like go from bending of surfaces to fusion events. Now, bending is actually a local event, 
And um, here, um, I've depicted these cartoons for both how trans and cis fusion uh, looks like. And then the energy of this system is basically um, uh, described in, in, in this equation here. But we now need to link this to uh, fusion events, which are basically topological changes, which are global. So um, what we do is we basically um, transform this energy function using local to global theorems and differential geometry. And then the energy of the system now becomes an explicit function of the topological quantities N and G. And then by using this uh, formalism, we can ask, OK, for um, what conditions favor a change in N? And, and then, for example, uh, we basically look at the signs of the cofactors um, in this equation. So, and so when we do this analysis, um, we can basically ask the question: but when does fusion occur? And then come up with an answer um, where uh, that it basically depends on the ratio of the tissue scale rigidity um, kappa bar and kappa. So this is the bending rigidity and the Gaussian um, bending rigidity. So. Um, the, the summary is that we can, uh, this is basically a uh, one dimensional state diagram where when this um, ratio is uh, of rigidities is uh, less than minus one, uh, this predicts no fusion. So it's, we can call it this like almost a arrested fusion state. And then when this uh, parameter is, takes a value between minus one and zero, only transfusion is allowed, um, predicting the system to um, um, become serious and there's free transfusion. And now when this parameter is positive, both trans and cis can occur. So uh, uh, predicting that the system will take the uh, wiffle ball uh, morphology. And if you uh, compare it to what, what we saw in the experiments, we have we can start to understand how different conditions are uh, kind of correspond in this uh, one dimensional state diagram. And what really kind of intrigued us was that, oh, if we can actually um, completely arrest fusion, um, maybe we can approach a, a system that's uh, closer to this far left here, um, similar to the rest of fusion. Now the question is, what, how can we do this? So in a search for a mo molecular regulator of epithelial fusion, I look for clues in the downstream targets of this chemical that we were adding, retinoic acid. So from RNA-seq, um, we looked at the downstream um, targets, and then I, I, I'm going to today talk about one um, molecular pathway um, that was uh, quite uh, uh, intriguing. So basically, this this revolves around an uh, um, enzyme called ENPP2. This is down transcriptionally downregulated by retinoic acid in, in our from our RNA seq data, and it's it's interesting because this um, was uh, this was a known enzyme that creates uh, a, a molecule called lysophosphatic acid, and this has been implicated in several. Um, neuroepithelial systems like rosettes or even brain and chimpanzee organoids from the Lancaster lab that this induces a drastic change in, for example, apical membrane opening or um, morphogenesis. So we thought this was a pretty good candidate to try. And luckily, there was actually a small molecule inhibitor against uh, the EMPP2, so which we can directly block the, the enzymatic function. So as you can see from this diagram, this begs the question, can we actually mimic the effect of renoic acid um, by simply adding HA130, the small molecule drug? So I'm happy to tell you that this actually worked. So this is basically in the absence of renoic acid, I'm now um, uh, titrating the dose of HA130. And if you look at these images, okay, it's, it's a bit hard, but you can hopefully see that the far left and the far right here ha are uh, have different uh, morphologies. And this is where really the quantification is, is useful because when we look at these day four organoids and then plot the, plot them on the shape diagram, what we find is that it basically the concentration um, um, allows us to reconstruct this trajectory along this shape diagram. And then the far right condition here, it almost um, is morphologically uh, closer to the sphere cylinder line than the whistle. 
Now uh, we can do this um, in a more extreme way and say, okay, well, what if we do a double treatment? Um, basically, if, if we believe that both red nitric acid and HA130 is controlling, uh, converging on the same control parameter, we might be able to get an uh, like additive effect. And indeed we do so. What we find is that when we do red nitric acid and then different concentration of HA130, we, we, we find these um, uh, the, the organoids to take these uh, shapes um, um, uh, that's consistent with um, basically uh, effectively changing this control parameter. And then in the far right here, you can see that it's really this extreme scenario where we have many small ovules, and then it really looks like they, they couldn't um, fuse um, properly in this case. And what's really satisfying now is to also look at the topological quantities. And then here we find that basically for, uh, we can summarize all the conditions I've shown you in the previous slide um, along a single axis where the, the topological quantities um, change monotonically as well as um, basically draw, uh, uh, reconst reconstructing this uh, unidirectional trajectory on the shape diagram. So we think um, this is really the one of the first examples where um, we've basically by Characterize uh, the coming up with a more a framework for shape and topology. We've been able to tune, fine tune the the uh, topology and shape in a, a multicellular systems. So that's kind of the summary of my um, this uh, recently published work. And um, we hope that this can uh, this uh, way of thinking and also um, different ways of um, controlling morphology could be applicable to um, other tissues. As well. So, um, just as one slide for my future like lab, like I'm really interested in taking these kind of quantitative imaging based approaches to um, organ uh, to engineer the um, the function and uh, and the organization of organoids. So we're looking into human brain organoids as well as cardiac organoids, and uh, really asking the question: How can we engineer morph morphology and 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 that leading to um, novel physiological functions for these um, tissues. And um, just as a plug for my new group, um, I'm, I've started re recruiting technicians, PhD students, and postdocs. So please let me know um, if you're interested in any of these keywords um, here. And um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, the, the labs I was involved in, in during my postdoc. I was part of um, three groups in the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, as well as the Research Institute of Molecular Pathology in Vienna, and um, had a wonderful time working with this uh, great team. So with that, um, I'd like to take uh, any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, KSK. Uh, great talk. I'll clap on the behalf of the audience. Uh, <clears throat> really interesting work. Uh, so we have a couple of questions, and uh, I had some of mine too. And uh, people, please post your questions in the chat. So the first question is from Louis Escobar. Uh, did, the did the response in rate of cis-fusion difference in treated versus untreated groups was dose-dependent, or was the presence of the retinoid more like a binary event? Um, mm. Yes, so <laughs> dose-dependent. Yeah, so one, one question, uh, one answer is um, the retinoic acid was actually... I, I tried the dose titration of retinoic acid, but I could, it was an all or nothing effect based on the morphology. So that's why it really, uh, I think finding one of the key cell biological regulators, lysosacetic acid in this case, was um, really, um, that, that was the one that really allowed us to tune, fine tune the uh, morphology. So not, not get a binary response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Ria Samanth had a question, uh, excellent talk. Just a curiosity, in your opinion, what kind of treatment would favor cis fusion in these systems? Oh, <laughs> what kind of treatment? Yeah, so yeah, because we, we haven't been able to do the, the promote cis fusion in more. Yeah. And then the, it, it is a tricky question because like, how, can, we, can we select transverse uh, cis? The, I, I think in the one dimensional diagram, it's only in one direction. So if you have, you can't really select cis over trans. It, if cis happens, trans will happen as well. But um, just, to, just a general way of promoting fusion, we haven't really looked into, for example, like cell adhesion factors, how that plays into, um, we have a theoretical idea of how might how that might f favor fusion, but uh, we, we haven't been able to, uh, 
do any kind of perturbations, especially quantitative ones. So I, I'm I'm very curious to uh, uh, test those out as well. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Uh, so Shankar Lalita Sridhar has a question. Are there any thoughts as to what exactly the second chemical regulator is doing to change the bending rigidity that seems to promote uh, more spherical arrested morphology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, great question. So um, <clears throat> it's it's what, what we can argue. So one thing we didn't really kind of cover was to get to this effective bending rigidity picture, um, we can relate this to the cell cell mechanical parameters, for example, like apical basal tension or you know tension asymmetry, for example. You can you can imagine that that'll make a more wedge shaped cell, preferring a highly curved surface, and that also might antagonize fusion. Um, but what exactly the second chemical? Thing? Yeah. So at the cell biological level, we don't have a clear answer. So one thing I'd like to do is actually to 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 see what kind uh, if we can do cell mechanical measurements to see to tease out which part of the cell mechanics is actually changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 